We've got another chapter to in our In the early 50s, what was to become, become a local programming like phenomenon premiered. The Old Rebel Show, starring George Perry. In the decades to come, thousands of children all across the Piedmont literally grew up with the Rebel. They had their birthday party on the show. But how did all this happen? There was a program called Six Gun Playhouse, and the master of ceremonies, or the kids MC for the show, was a guy named Portman Paget, who got his break to go to New York uh, in the fall of 1951. And with Portman leaving, that naturally left a hole in our schedule because we had a lot of old movies to run, uh, a lot of old westerns and uh, a lot of the old cliffhanger serials. And we needed somebody to get on and talk in between those. And, and that I, I say it that way because that's literally the approach. We said, go on and say something between these movies. And so when this guy left, we said, well, what are we going to do? Uh, George Perry said, I believe I could do that. So he, he became the MC on Six Gun Playhouse and developed the character of the old rebel. The first performer added to the rebel show was staff announcer Jim Tucker. Well, the old rebel was looking for a partner or looking for somebody to help him out. And I happened to know two or three chords on the guitar. And I said, well, we'll try something. And uh, I brought in my old guitar, it was an old one I'd had since I was a child, uh, and uh, we started doing a few little folk songs, some we borrowed from Burl Ives from here and from there, and uh, finally I got a better guitar, and a few years later went to uh, the old five-string banjo when the Kingston Trio was, was popular, mm -hmm. and uh, then I went to, finally had a one-man band, or for a number of years, I won't say how many exactly, but we uh, played to over 100,000 households every afternoon. I started, I wanted to be a, a, a person who could do something, a, you know, a little, at least a little bit along the cowboy line, so I got interested in trick roping. I'd always been a Will Rogers fan. And uh, I scouted around and got some basic information on it and learned to do a few of the simpler tricks. And then, well, I got lucky. Uh, Haynes Corporation here in Winston-Salem and Bluebell over in Greensboro decided to sponsor a rodeo every year. They brought in the top names, very best in the country, and they had some of the best trick rope artists. Mm -hmm. And I got to know them, people like Virginia Hadley and Rex Rossi and Jackie Reinhardt, Jack Bushbaum. I'd follow them around. They'd come out and be on our program, and then uh, they'd tell me, to come on out, I'll show you a few more tricks. So every year I'd learn a few more, and finally, uh, finally got a pretty good routine going. Lee Marshall, as Lonesome Lee the Clown, fulfilled a lifelong ambition to perform, playing a foil to the Rebels' antics. Uncle Roy Griffin, for years director of the Greensboro Community Center, Roy led songs and cheers and acted in skits. Sometimes members of the production crew were recruited or volunteered to be a part of the Reb supporting cast. When I had the opportunity to uh, fill in, basically as a puppeteer, uh, on George's show when his puppeteer, I think, took a job in another market, George asked who would like to try this, and I said, well, I'll give it a try. I was a ham at heart. And George taught me an awful lot about not only television and basics as far as that goes. I think he had been in the business for many, many years before I had, uh, got involved with him. But uh, his, his ability to work with children and understand not only children, but uh, what tends to motivate them and uh, a very genuine, sincere, and I think that's very important because there are a lot of people who can program at children, but there's not that many that can program at children and children can also relate back to them. And George had that, that unique talent. So I learned an awful lot from him and I think he had that indeed genuine love for people, but certainly I think he did have that special uh, spot in his heart for children. I ain't made out of balsa wood. I think George carved me. He did the, he did the whole thing. He, was, he used to love to get into that. He used to carve and do what nuts. I've got a look. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't move. I'll hold my head still. How's that? Any better? I used to flop my ears a bunch, too. <laughs> we ended up calling him Mr. Wigglesworth because we couldn't find anything funnier than the name Wigglesworth for a four-year-old kid to try to say. So he became Mr. Wigglesworth, and uh, I just kind of cracked my voice a little, and uh, I, I still find myself talking to my hands a lot in business meetings. Hello. So it was a, a kind of an evolutionary thing. Carol Stoker had graduated from radio as a, as a woman's director uh, into television as a woman's director. And it, 
most of what happened in the early days of television was driven by what radio had done. Uh, so this was a natural transition for Carol. So uh, uh, one of the things that uh, early television could handle was a, was a woman's director being on doing interviews with people. So Carol naturally rolled over from radio into television and became the woman's director of Channel 2 Television. 